we'll get started. You all are in for a real treat this afternoon. The planning committee spent a lot of time talking about keynote speakers and how we should sequence them and so forth. So let me share our thinking with you very quickly. We wanted to inspire you. We wanted to demonstrate creative solutions. And we wanted to provide best practices. So our speaker this afternoon, I guarantee you, will inspire and motivate you. And I'd like to first introduce Arnesha Walker, who is, after 30 years, I can't believe it, but 30 years working in Child Protective Services, joined the University of Houston as a Title IV-E uh, coordinator in the Graduate College of Social Work. And so we've asked her to introduce our keynote speaker for this afternoon, Ms. Walker. Thank you. Cedric S. McKenzie was born in Little Rock, Arkansas. At six days old, his mother abandoned him in the hospital, and he was placed in the child welfare system, where he remained for 20 years. Cedric was placed in a special needs home, even though he didn't have any special needs. And when he aged out of the system, he was basically told, here's your file and have a good life. At that time, apparently, they didn't have permanency planning. They didn't terminate parental rights and place children in adoption. So he didn't have a very good experience in the foster care system. However, that didn't prevent him from going on and making something out of himself. Mr. McKenzie has a bachelor's degree in social work that he received from the University of Arkansas in Pine Bluff. And he has a master's degree in business from Amberton University in Garland, Texas. He has been employed for over 23 years for the Social Security Administration in Dallas, Texas, and looks forward to retirement in the next couple of years. He is involved with the Kappa Alpha Psi fraternity, where he is the vice president of the Dallas alumni, and he's also been a board member. He is actively involved with young men and serves as a mentor. He travels across the country doing seminars and workshops and really speaks about the foster care system and how it affected his life and what needs to be done to prevent that same mistake from happening to other children in the foster care system. He has written a book entitled She Never Answered, in which he sold over 120,000 copies. And in that book, he talks about the life that he spent in the foster care system and the things that he went through and how he just kind of lingered and nobody ever came to rescue him. He is in the process of writing his second book, which is a follow-up to the first one, and it should be out in the next year or two. Ladies and gentlemen, I'd like to introduce to you our first keynote speaker, Mr. Cedric S. McKenzie. How y'all doing? Can you hear me pretty well or pretty good? It is so good to be in Galveston, Texas, and I want to thank my friend, Professor um, Alvin Salib, for giving me the opportunity to be with you. Um, and thank you, Anita, for the introduction. And, and I want to thank you, the professional social workers and the different universities who strive to have excellent social workers. Because I don't believe when I was born in Little Rock, Arkansas, we had those social workers or those administrators who really knew uh, what we need to do for children, what, what, where the, what those children was there for. Um, I pride myself every day to always give back to those that are in a uh, disadvantage and those are those uh, kids that need, need our love and our support. And you know, we always wonder, you know, what, how do foster children end in foster care? And you know, why do they turn out the way they turn out? the good or the bad. And you, as those individuals, those professionals out there, are the ones that can make that difference 
um, for those social workers, those professionals who are, have the love and the support of wanting to work with children. And as you know, we know that social workers don't make a lot of money. You know, I, used, I graduated from the university with a social work degree, and I want to thank Dr. Stewart, my former professor, who really gave me, stand up, Dr. Stewart, let's folks see you. I can remember so many years ago, 20 plus years ago, and she still looked young, how she, how she carried me and walked me through that program because I started out as a music major uh, at Henderson State University, and then I transferred to Arkansas Pine Bluff, and I decided I wanted to be a, a social work major because I wanted to know, you know, what happens behind the scenes uh, with potential social workers and case managers. What do they learn in college, and what are they preparing themselves to do because of what happened to me? And so I decided to uh, change my major to um, be a social work uh, major. And I want to thank Dr. Stewart for really guiding me step by step, making sure, now she had to bring me back in to make sure that I was focused on my, uh, my goals and my dreams, because I shared with her so many times, Dr. Stewart, I'm going to write a book one day, Dr. Stewart, I'm going to get a degree, and I'm going to tell those folks what they did to me, and they're going to know Cedric. And 20 something years later, that dream has come true. Now. But how did that dream really come true for me for where I came from and where I'm trying to go to? And you know, I can remember so, so many years of all the destructions. You hear me? Destruction. What happens in a foster home that you may not even, you may hear it on television, you may read it in the newspaper. But to experience what goes on in that foster home to see the abuse, to see the neglect of what children really, really go through will make you do a better job at how you do what you do as a professional. And why those students who decide to attend your university decide to be a social work major and decide to take that job, that they're going to make a difference for those kids of tomorrow. And I am so happy and so glad that today we have those professional social workers and those administrators in those universities today that can make that dream come true for those students and those children that they're working on their behalf. Now, when I look at my life where I came from, you know, you see me in a suit, it's okay. I'm happy to wear a suit every day for the last 23 years. But what's behind the scene, what's behind the feelings of the suit? What does one really feel? What do they really go through through a journey of foster care? Now look at my success, a couple of degrees, working on my PhD now, hope to finish in a couple of years, working on that second book, the first book, did good. Does it stop there for me? No, it doesn't, because we still have problems with a system they call foster care. And I'm so happy that we have this program to help Child Protective Services to do a better job as far as those children. Not all my experience was bad. There were essential people in my life that gave me an opportunity. They gave me hope. And that's what you guys are doing. You're giving that child that you don't even know hope. You don't know their circumstances. You don't know if they came from an abused mother or father. You don't know if that child got left at the hospital like myself. You don't know if that child was sexually abused, psychologically abused, or physically abused. You don't know. But when that, when that student graduates from college and she picks, he or she picks up that first case file, will she be ready or will he be ready to endure what they're going to go through in their professional life as a case manager and as a case worker? I wrote this book, She Didn't Have an Answer, because I had to write that book. I told so many people for so many years, I'm going to write a book about my life. If I, if I do good, I'm going to write this book 
15 years later, I still didn't write, I still didn't have this book right written yet. And people always say, now you graduated from college, Cedric. You told me you was going to write a book. When, when's your book going to come out? When I sat down there for so many days, nine months exactly, I started writing. The tears, the pain, the frustrations, the past history, had to recall all of that mess. Had to come back to me. If, I have, if, I'm, if I'm going to ever live the dream that I said that I wanted to live one day, I had to overcome some of my problems, my frustration. Because I'm still, well, I'm better. I used to be mad at the system. When I drive to Arkansas down that highway and I, rem and I can recall all that mess for so many years that happened to me, I get upset. But that upset kind of like move away from me for a moment because I can't change what happened to me. But I definitely could change what's happening in the present and what's going to happen in the future. Can you imagine me being a 45-year-old man who was left at the hospital when I was six days old by my mother. What was going on with her for her to make that decision? I'm glad you asked. That is a good question. My mother was a 21-year-old woman, already had a four-year-old son she couldn't take care of. And then she had me. And I always say to myself today, what happened way back then can reflect on what's going on today. Why did my mother give me away after having five children and I was the second child? You know that messes with me, don't you? Of all the kids that my mother had, I was the only one she gave away at that hospital. Now, be very careful what you write in your daily activities when you're dealing with children. Because some years later, it can hurt you like my big thick case file. I can read that file each and every day and know what every one of those social workers, case managers, and administrators, what they documented about Cedric and what happened when it happened. When I say I did, it was not all the bad. Some people helped me in that Latin part of my life as that foster child. But how many kids do you know to go through a system will be strong enough to beat those odds against them? There were a few people that were on my side. That last foster mother who decided, I'll take him in. I'll take him. Even when the others said no. My last foster mother, my senior year, junior year in high school, when I done all the bad things you can imagine, took me in. Even when she knew I was one of those kids that would probably hurt somebody, but well, she took me in anyway. Bill Clinton, who was that governor that gave me opportunity to go to college when, he, when I was, just wanted to go to college to that one social worker who told me to get my case file and to read it. And then sue us when you read it. What you write and what you document can hunt you for the good or the bad. Make note that every child that enters the system we call foster care, like I said earlier, I don't know how they got there, but they end up in foster care. They are innocent kids, innocent children that have no decisions among themselves. Remember, I was a six days old child who had no decisions about nothing. But you as the professionals, the social workers, the administrators, I was now in your loving arms. I was a good candidate for adoption because my mother decided she didn't want to have anything to do with me ever again. And I always ask, why did my mother have me? Why did she go through nine months of pregnancy to have me and give me away? It messes with the psychological mind. 
I was a candidate for adoption and the state decided, yeah, we're gonna get this child adopted. You're now in the loving hands of adoption specialists. Right there it tells you when I was born. They documented my file. Child was born November 7, 1966 at 2.54 p.m. I was a candidate to be adopted. Why did it not happen? There was a court order that said this child is going to be adopted. You see that petition? What did it say? Children's Service, the State Department of Public Welfare in Arkansas, meaning that they were my guardians. The court said, you, he is now in your hands. Now this child is going to be adopted, meaning that we will give him a loving home. We will give him the love and support that he needs, even though his mother left him in, in our care. We're going to take care of him. But adoption never happened. I was at a temporary foster home until I got adopted. And look at this. My adoption went through three hands. Social worker, case manager, adoption specialist. Nobody, no one interacted upon the petition for me to be adopted. So that temporary foster home was a placement for mentally ill, disabled children. This lady was 64 and a half years old when she took me in. She only went to the third grade. She only knew how to cater to mentally ill, disabled children. Back in the days, they called them retarded children. These are disabled children. I was an innocent child. That was the first home I went to when I was six days old until they got me adopted. And guess what? I stayed in that home. Cedric is now 13 months old. He is now walking. Cedric is now two years old. I am very concerned because we never got him adopted. Cedric is now three years old. Oh my Lord, where is his mother? I don't know. She made a decision that she didn't want to keep him. We don't have any more communications about anyone in his family. He did have a grandmother and a grandfather and even an aunt who wanted to take him in. But we decided that was a no because he is in a better situation. Cedric is now four years old. Cedric is a slow learner. Is this because we have put him in a situation that put his, puts him in a disadvantage? I am really concerned. I went to the adoption specialist who handled his case, but he told me, let it go. Now this woman is 68 years old now. What I learned in my foster home is my surroundings, my community was my brother's and my sisters. But I am so happy, I am so glad that even today, we got this new administration, such as yourselves, the faculties at universities, the good social workers, child protective services, to make a better decision of kids not being put in the same situation such as myself. That's a picture of my mother. Can you imagine they gave me a picture of my mother? What was she thinking about while I was in that foster home, five years old and six years old, watching my sisters get raped by the next door neighbors, getting beatings by my mother for no reason at all? Teacher is telling me I am a special education student because I didn't know anything about an educational setting because I never experienced that in my foster home. Now, I did watch television on Saturdays. 
I'm just a bill. Conjunction, conjunction, what's your function? I did learn those things. Zoom, 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 I zoom. The electric company. Sesame Street. Major Rogers neighborhood. Those are things I remember by watching television and try to transition that over to what I was learning in school was not working for me. Now I had a grandfather who wanted to help my mother. Now my family originated out of Michigan. They wanted to help her. Even despite she didn't despite that she didn't want me. But social welfare decided no. Why? My grandfather had a job with production, General Motors, for I don't know how many years. My grandmother also. Why would they not let those folks take this innocent little kid in? Why? They asked, I will help him. And my aunt from California, I will help his mother. And they said no. But I am so glad and so happy that you folks here are not like that. My siblings and I, you see me on the far left, your right. Those are my two brothers, my three sisters. My sister in the white, the, old, the older sister, she, she was the one that always got raped over and over and over again. I remember at six days, six years old, I was watching a wrestling match with my brother with the checkered shirt. His name is Jeff. His name is Jeff in the book. I can't tell you his real name because, again, we don't want to tell uh, the real names of, uh, of former foster kids. But we were watching a wrestling match, and Mr. Pert was the handyman that used to work for my foster mother. And Mr. Pert came and raped my sister at six years old. That was my experience of walking in the room, seeing her legs wide open and her crying. Should a six-year-old experience seeing something like that? And where was my foster mother? She took a bus ride down to downtown and went to Woolworths. I don't think any of you folks are old enough to know what Woolworths is, right? Okay. Guess who took that picture? Can anybody tell me who took that picture? Now, we're a foster family. We're kids. We, we were standing up. Who would take that picture? A social worker took that picture. I saw the social worker only when we were allegedly happy. I am concerned that Cedric is still in the same foster home. We are neglecting his welfare as a child. I took Cedric to the circus one day. He cried the whole time. I even took him to the zoo and he ran out the gate, scared of the animals. What is going on with Cedric? Am I painting a picture here? These folks are following me through where I am from six days old until I ran out the gate from the zoo. Cedric is a slow learner. Is it that I'm not getting the education that I should get because of my home setting? I had unthinkable abuse. Not only did my foster mother wood me over and over again, the neighbor, the other neighbor, her friends. Can you imagine that? Now, rats and roaches was my friend because they slept along with me at my household. Social workers visited the house and they did their assessment, they monitored. Did they not see the rats and roaches? Or maybe they just didn't come out in the daytime. 
There were foster kids that go in and out of that household the years that I was there. I started stealing when I was eight years old after I found out that my foster mother got money for me. I didn't even know what money was. I didn't even know what a foster home was. I didn't even know that old woman was my mother, foster mother, until we made her mad. I never got the bring your friends over to the house parties, kind of what they do now. I'm going to Jeff's house, we're going to have a Nintendo party, we're going to, we're going to eat. We're going to celebrate what happened this week in school. We're just going to have a good time. I never experienced that. I never spent, experienced the bike rides, the, none of that stuff. My foster home was set up the way it was designed. You stay in the front of the house, you go outside, you come back home. That's it. My friends were the streets. Nine years old and 10 years old, I started looking more for my friends and my peers who can help me, who can give me that love that my home was not giving me because I hated that house. They documented in my file that I was having a psychological problem. Would I not? You put me in the situation. Why would I not have a psychological problem? Why would I not have the special education, astro, special educational attributes they say I had? I started doing more and more disobedient things, especially stealing, because that was my safe haven to go to school to look good in front of my friends. I had a girlfriend when I was 12 years old. She was 27, and she was my neighbor down the street. Can you imagine that? I had a 27-year-old girlfriend at 12. When my foster mother went to sleep, I snuck out the house to go see my girlfriend. They gave me counseling, social service paid for counseling, because they're trying to figure out what can we do to try to help this boy. But they did not know it was a little bit too late for me because I didn't think they cared about me anyway. They only came when I did something bad. So I made, I made, it a, um, I made my choice that I was going to continue to do bad because I wanted to see that social worker and tell her about herself. Why am I in this home? Where's my mother and where's my father? So why did y'all put me in this situation? I went to school every day, loved school. But school was a place that I learned a lot of different things on the streets from my friends. Now, if you look at me in this picture, you probably think I'm older than what I am. I'm in the ninth grade at Plasky Hikes uh, Junior High School. One thing that I would never, I would never do, I wouldn't hurt you. Because my love and my heart, I could never do that. But I will steal from you as quick as you say hello to me. I got beat up several times at this skating rink in Little Rock called Giggles Roller Skating. Suffered a concussion. And can you imagine that was really the first time that I saw that my foster mother had a little love for me? because she, see, she saw that I was injured. And she started taking up for me when those social workers came. She never told when I, went, when I snuck out the house. Uh, she never, she even never told them that when I got arrested in the ninth grade at a Plasky Hikes when I uh, was playing baseball. And I was trying to steal a soda pop uh, from a 7-Eleven store. But the only reason why I don't have a record, because I've been with the government for 23 years, the only reason why I don't have a record is because I was working at that store at nighttime meaning the manager was doing something illegal. I was 15 years old. But a lot of times, certain, certain situations that affect you can probably be a safe haven to save you. Now, I participate in a lot of different sports because I like to run. Gang members used to run after me. So why not put Cedric in sports? Play basketball or play football cross-country championship team at Plasky Hikes in Little Rock, Arkansas. I had been in this foster home all the way up until that point. They gave me this social worker, this licensed social worker. Can y'all hear me pretty good? They gave me this licensed social worker. His name was Pat Harding. 
And here he said to me, I'm looking at your file. He just said, I see they never put you up for adoption. I can't understand that. And I understand why you're the way you are. He said, because we, they've neglected you for so many years. He said, what do you want? He said, if I send you to a white family, would that be okay? I said, I'm okay with whoever. Just get me out of that house with that old woman. Quite naturally, it never happened because I stole a television from my older foster brother. I sold that TV for $20. My foster mother got tired of that because the people that I hung around with were gang members. That was my friends. One July day, working at the Mexico Chiquita in Little Rock, I went home and the social worker's car was at her house. But I did not know, I mean, I know I've done some wrong things, got away with it, but, you know, I didn't know this social worker was really there to pick me up and take me away. And can you imagine all those years I had been with this one woman who I called Mama? I was on my way out of the door. And it probably was the best thing that could have ever happened to me in my life. Now again, not every kid will be strong enough to beat the odds going to a foster care situation like that. I got kicked out of that foster home and I ended up in a youth facility, a youth home. And I chose Pine Bluff, Arkansas because I didn't want my friends seeing me ride in a white van in Little Rock. So I took the option, it was the Ark Youth Center. And that probably was the best thing that could have ever happened to me because that was the first time ever in my life I was in a setting of understanding who Cedric really was. It was 15 girls and 15 guys. 15 boys was upstairs, 15 girls downstairs. We took a shower together, we ate together, we studied together. Now that wasn't good for me because I have never experienced that before. And it was difficult for me to see, to go from one city to another, to a youth home, and all my past and my future was gone. Now, social workers, when you say something to a kid that you're going to do, do it. Because the social worker that picked me up told me, I will come back and pick you up. We're going to see if we can find a place for you, a permanent placement until you get ready to graduate from high school. And I'll pick you up in two weeks. She picked me up on a Friday, and that Monday she had resigned from her job. She did not transfer that information that she had told me to the new social worker. So I'm in this youth home, which was the best thing that could happen to me because I learned how to study. I participated in a band because I love music. So Dr. Stewart, I was going to be a music major once upon a time until I met you and I started, decided to be a social work major because I love music because I just love music. Being in that youth home gave me opportunity to go to Wisconsin to be in a band. Uh, bank at a band camp. It also gave me an opportunity to meet this counselor who told me I only had two choices in life. One choice you can be, you can be successful or you can be the choice that they told you you're going to be, you're going to end up in jail or dead. Which one do you want? And it also gave me an opportunity to meet that social worker who told me about this case file, who told me about suing the agency if I do well. Just read it. I participated in band, football, track, name it, in high school because I wanted to do something. But in the back of my mind, I still wanted to know who my family was, what happened to me, and why did I end up in the situation that I'm in. Somebody belonged to me. I belonged to someone. When I got that case file from the Department of Human Service. That was the worst experience that I could ever experience 
picking up that case file and reading what my mother did from day one and what the department did that they should have did but they didn't do. I was hurt to know why I was still in a situation that I was in. But that, but that social worker told me not to give up. Hang in there. You got talent. I ain't got no talent because nobody believed in me until that point. Remember, that social worker. And then when I graduated from that youth home, I went to two other foster homes, two additional foster homes. I failed tremendously because I didn't know these people. The state was setting something up for me as when you fail in foster home, you get into a certain age, they set something up for you where you're going to be institutionalized because there's nothing, anything they can do for you. This foster mother was the last person who decided to take me in, despite of what was in my file, despite what was against me, despite how I was, she took me in and said, I'll take him. That was the best foster home for me because she treated me like her own child. Now, my grades were not all that, but they weren't bad at all either. What I learned in that U-Tone was to learn that there was a possibility that I may be able to graduate from high school. Now, social workers and case managers, be very careful when you're talking among kids who you think is not going to make it. Be very careful what you say and how you say it. This social worker who was that freshman social worker who decided to go outside of her protocol to help me. That administrator, that's, that her supervisor said, ain't nothing going to happen to him. He's not going to be any good. We'll wait till he fails. When he turns his age 18, we'll just kick him out. And when he's kicked out, ain't nowhere for him to go anyway. But now, jail or death. Now, can you imagine me sitting out in a hallway while that administrator, that supervisor is talking to that social worker? And the only thing I can do is cry. Because I was setting, they were setting me up that I wasn't, going to, I wasn't going to be productive. I wasn't going to be a good citizen. I was going to be like they said I was going to be. But that counselor always told me in that you tone, you got two choices, which one you want. So I decided to take the successful story. I graduated from high school. Yeah, that's me. I know I don't have any hair on my head today. But that is me. Can you imagine at this point, six days old, through a foster home for mentally ill disabled children, through a youth home, to one final good foster home, and to graduate from high school. Now, when I graduated, and I love music so well, I decided to take a trip to California. The state paid for it, but the state also gave me 30 days. Once he go out there, he's out. Now, when I graduated from high school, I didn't see anybody from the state there. My foster mother was there, and my junior high coach was there. But I graduated from high school, and I wanted to go to college. I took a trip to California, and then I came back because I didn't know anybody in California. And then plus, they lied to me. They said I was going to get a full scholarship. They was only going to give me a half scholarship in San Diego. So I ended up back in Arkansas. 
But the state said, I'm sorry. School is already in session. You're going to have to wait till next semester. Or better yet, you can join the military. They'll pay for you to go to college. So I called my friend, a social worker. And she said, no, no, no. You're still a state kid. Don't let them tell you to join the military. Don't let them tell you you can't go to school because if you don't go to school, you're no longer a state kid. Now, you know, I had no money because the Delta Airlines lost all my luggage on my way back from California to Arkansas. So I saw this commercial on television. It was a governor of Arkansas, Bill Clinton, the governor of Arkansas. And a spotlight came in my head. Bill Clinton is the governor. I'm a state kid. So that means he's my father. <laughs> I'm going to talk to Bill Clinton. Now, I'm not going to tell you how I got there and what I did, because I'm not going to ever put myself in a uh, future compromising situation. But I'm not going to tell you what I did or how I maneuvered the situation to get what I needed to get. But let me let you know that Bill Clinton made it happen for me to attend college. I was there that one day. The next day I got a phone call and told me to attend Henderson State University. When I attended college and be on that campus and see other students that didn't even know me, they didn't know anything about my past of being in a foster home. Even though I was a state kid, I asked to stay in foster care until I attained age 21. Now let me let you know at this point in my life I still did not know who my family was. I still didn't have any idea what my future was because all I knew was the foster care system. Now, Bill Clinton I saw again later on down the road when I was in college. I attended the 25th anniversary of Southeast Arkansas Mental Health Center Banquet. And that was the, also the place that I was under on the ARC Youth Center. And Cedric, he said, Cedric, you're doing so well. I'm glad that you're still in college, but always know, make sure you give something back to somebody else because someone did something for you. I transferred to Arkansas Pine Bluff, Dr. Stewart, because I got this girl pregnant. And I understood what social work is. I understand what placement was about. And I said to myself that they did me like this. I said, one day I'm going to write a book about this and tell everyone. I was abused. I was neglected. But I still fought anyhow because there were some people there for me. Now, I graduated from Arkansas Pine Bluff in 1991. And Dr. Stewart, do you remember, I was number two in the social work department. Can you imagine? Foster kid. Look at this picture. Six days old. High school. College. Number two in the program, Vice President of Student Government, Acting President of a Student Government. Only a few people gave me an opportunity. You can start now and giving those students the opportunity they need so they can have the vehicle to drive those kids to where they need to get to. I had a job with the United States government. Can you imagine them asking me about my life, where I came from? I didn't lie. They said, well, you don't have a record. I said, because I didn't get caught. I didn't get caught. I still had no family, and I want to know what happened to me. And I definitely wanted to be a role model for those kids, needing that love and the support they still need each and every day. What people said about me in the past, those social workers, those administrators, developed my concept, my self-concept about myself. 
A foster child who never found a permanent home, I am consumed with and sometimes haunted by the words of people who were in and out of my life. I often reflected on what people said to me, how it shaped my concept of who I am, even to this day, as I have experienced what people may say to ch and about a foster child, child can build or hinder or shatter his or her self-concept. Now, my self-concept was shattered for so many years, but it was redeveloped later on down the road of those people that gave me that love and that support. As I said to you earlier, most kids will not be, will not be strong enough to beat those odds. Because what happened way back when can affect a child now. Because whatever happened to me way back when affects me now because I have a mother that I know now that I can't even hug her. And I have four siblings who can. At age 30 was the first time in my life that I sat down and had a family to talk to. Let me tell you the story. I had a friend who died. You heard the Oklahoma bombing? There was a colleague of mine I went to college with. He died in that bomb. I went to his funeral. I met this lady. Now let me let you know. Them kids need to know who, they, who, they, who their brothers and sisters and cousins are. Okay? I'm going to let you know. I'm, I, my first experience that. That pretty lady that I saw was that cousin of mine because she said, your last name is the same last name as my mother's maiden name. She said, but your name is spelled M-C-K-E-N-Z-I-E. My mother's name is spelled M-C-K-I-N-Z-I-E. She said, where are you from? I said, I'm from Little Rock. I said, where are you from? She said, I'm from Lona, Arkansas. She said, let me ask my mother and we'll call you back. Well, I ended up finding out my mother spelled my name wrong. It should have been spelled M-C-K-I-N-Z-I-E. But she spelled it M-C-K-E-N-Z-I-E. And that girl that I thought that I wanted to date was my cousin. <laughs> but that was one of the most wonderful feelings that a man could feel. When you search each and every day for who your family, who are they? Who do I belong to? But just to sit there, and they drove me over to my great uncle's house and my great aunt's house. Can you imagine sitting over there and looking at these folks and saying, you're my uncle, you're my aunt, and you're my cousin. All that hatred that I had I guess those social workers I didn't like went away. Because that dream that I dreamed came true. The lady in the middle was the cousin I went to college with because she played basketball at the university. My cousin Cynthia on the other side is the girl that I met that I almost dated. Even if the Department of Human Service in Little Rock did me wrong, because I can't judge and go against people who was not there that, it, that caused a problem with me. There were new people there. Well, I ain't going to say that. There were still some people that were there that shouldn't have been there, but they still was there. But there were new people that had nothing to do with me, so I still had to give my love and support for those kids that were still in Arkansas that needed help. So I did a thing called There's No Place Like Home. Because... I needed to do what I said I was going to do, even though if I still was pissed off and I was mad at the system, I still had to do what I had to do as that alumnus. I even joined the Kiwanis Club in 1998 because the Kiwanis Club, they take care of children. They're in bad, desperate situations and community and schools. I found out, like I told y'all, I had four brothers and a sister. No, three brothers and a sister. I was the fourth son. The brother that I have a relationship to even today, my great uncle told me, he said, of any of your siblings that would probably communicate with you, it's probably your brother, the one that's in prison. You need to go see him. Now, Reggie is 44 and I'm 45. So can you imagine that my first brother, then me, 
then Reginald, then Devin, then my sister, Tari. Now how did number one stay in, and number two is gone, three, four, and five stayed? I met my brother and he was more shocked than I was. He graduated from the prison life in 19, oh, 2003. And that's Pam and I, that's my, um, my cousin I went to college with. Didn't even know she was my cousin. Saw her many times when I was in college. Even though my brother made mistakes in his life and went to prison, he had to suffer the consequences for his actions and things that he did. I could have been there also the way I was growing up, the way I was doing things. It's just that a few people believe in me and I didn't go that route. Can you imagine, Dr. Stewart, of all the things you used to tell me when I was in college, you're very smart, Cedric. Stay focused. Who would have ever thought 20-something-year-old kid would be an artist talking to you, Dr. Stewart. Only because I was still focused and paid a little attention at the end. My brother has two children. My niece, Maisha. And my nephew, Reggie. And let me tell you what happened way back then can affect what's going on now today. I have a relationship with Maisha, who is my niece. I have a relationship with Reggie, who is my nephew. I have a relationship with my son, Reggie and my brother. Reggie and Maisha has a relationship with my mother, which is their grandmother. My brother, Reggie, no longer has a relationship with my mother because Reggie decided to have a relationship with Cedric. Maisha and Reggie has a relationship with my mother, but they're not going to tell my mother that they hang out with their uncle because they no longer will have a relationship with my mother. My other siblings decided to, to have a relationship with my mother, but they don't have a relationship with me. Now, my mother was 21 years old. And I'm end up finding now that my mother had me by another man who was white and Dominican. My other siblings was by their father who she married once upon a time. So can you imagine she made a decision, I don't want to have nothing to do with him because of the circumstances, but I'm going to keep my other children. So what happened way that back then still can affect what's going on now. Have I ever touched my mother? Have I ever hugged her? No. Have I ever talked to my mother? Yes. Ring, 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 the telephone ring. Hello? I said, hello, this is Cedric. I just want to call you and let you know I'm your son. I know who you are. Click. Ring, ring, ring. That's my uncle told me to call her again. Hello. I said, this is Cedric, I'm calling you. I know who you are. Are you a maniac on a loose trying to destroy my family? I'm going to call the police on you. Click. And that's the last time I talked to my mother. Like my brother said, probably the next time I talk to her, as if I'm dead, getting ready to die, or she's in her, at the funeral home, which is okay. Because my cousins, my uncles, my aunts, I'm cool. Does it still affect me within my heart? Yes. Yes. Can I change that on her? No. Should I still move on? Yes. I still got a goal to go. Like my niece said, your mama read your book. I said, she did. What was her reaction? She didn't have any. She just read it and she read it and she read it. I went to sleep and I came back in the room and she still was reading it. And my nephew said, Grandmother know who you are, which is good. 
So many days, Mother's Day, something always hit my heart. But make certain those other kids that are out there that need to be adopted, that need their mother one day, make sure they don't miss a Mother's Day. I share with you about me. And it ain't about me. It's about what I went through that we don't want other kids to go through. I'm very happy you guys are here. You have this program to help those awarding students to be better case managers, to be better case workers, to be better social workers, because that's what it's about. You know, I always said to myself, why they don't pay social workers? Why they don't pay the teachers? Maybe one day I can run for congressman or something. Maybe I can help change those situations, the politics of situations. They can't say anything bad about me when I run for office because I was just like, hey, yeah, I used to be a foster child. I was supposed to do things wrong. Whatever your role, it's a birth parent, social worker, foster parents. Please heed the general warning of a foster child who, in spite of what people said because of God, succeeded. But not all foster children will be able to overcome the impact of people who say things that have negative results. So why, why you guys will gamble on the child's life? Let us renew our commitment to foster children by continuously speaking words of encouragement into their lives. So Dr. Stewart, I thank you. Teachers know when there's a foster kid in the audience. The principal knows when there's a foster kid in the audience. But Dr. Stewart, I want to thank you for not judging me with my past. I want to thank that one social worker who believed in me and put her and jeopardized her job to help me. And I want to thank you, Dr. Salih, for giving me the opportunity to always help you and support your organization, all the way back from New Mexico State, 1998 to 2004. What's this year? 2012. So audience, continue doing what you do best. Make certain that you get those fundings to help those kids, to make certain that they get the love and respect that they are due. And I want to thank you for doing your due diligence to be at this conference, to hear myself, Cedric, and others for the next couple of days. As I said earlier, not every foster kid will be strong enough to beat the odds of life despair. Make certain when you go out there and get your first job, one thing that you will know and understand from what I'm trying to say to you, every foster child that goes through the foster care system, they are mighty kings and queens sent from God above. When they graduate from that system, and they do well, such as the ones that I talked to, Tyrone, I have a, a student who used to be a foster child who graduated from Texas A&M Commerce uh, three years ago. And I told him I was coming down here. He said, well, call me when you make it here, Cedric. I said, I'll call you. I ain't call him. So I went to sleep. But he called me this first thing this morning and said, you ain't call me. You told me you was going to call me mentee. That's what he called me, mentee. You said you was going to call me. That's all he asked me to do was call him. And when I think about Tyrone, I think about all those foster kids in my pathway of just for the last few years. They are mighty kings and queens sent from God above. The tears, the pain, it doesn't matter anymore. It's a Tyrone graduated. He works on his master in counseling at the University of Houston.
When you wake up in the morning, everyone in this room, when you wake up in the morning, you may or may not have any children, I don't know. But when you wake up early in the morning, walk past your window, just look outside, outside. And when you see the blue sky, and when you see the sun shining so bright, think of me and those foster kids that need your love and support, need your help. Foster kids are like a bird. They fly so high because no one can touch them now. Because they can't touch me now. Every now and then I had to land in a tree and recall all the bad and good things that has happened. What can I do better to make it better for them? You do the same. Now, when you get out that tree, make sure you land on solid ground. When you land on that solid ground, reflect on why you are here and why you do what you do. Go ahead and go back in the house. It's dark now. Don't worry, worry about me. I'm not going to rob you. I'm not going to take nothing from you. And I graduated from that. Always and understand that those foster kids are the same way. They need your love. They need their support. They need someone to talk to them. But before you look, close those curtains, look outside. You see those stars. Can you imagine the stars? Could be you. You can put those twinkle in those kids' eyes as each and every day goes by. Because with you, their dreams will come true. Now, again, I want to thank you for giving me the opportunity to speak with you. I have books in the audience. If you want a book, meet me outside. Anybody have any questions or you want to talk to me about anything, I'll be here for the next uh, day and a half. Again, I want to thank you for giving me the opportunity to speak with you. Continue doing what you do best. Move forward not backwards. I can always be found if you want me to talk with you sometime. It's not about money for me. Is that right, Dr. Ali? It's about the love that we give for those children that need our support. And Dr. Stewart, thank you. Thank you, folks. We celebrate a lot of heroes in our society, and this man is my hero. The courage that he shows time after time that I invite him to come and present, and he does, never fails to show up and deliver, and I appreciate that very much, Cedric. I also have some wishes. I wish that all of you that are faculty, all of those of you who are trainers, will take advantage of the fact that the University of Houston downtown paid to videotape this and will have it available on our website. And I hope that every prospective social worker or every current social worker has an opportunity to witness what Cedric just said. I think it would make a tremendous impact on the field, and I appreciated that so much. As Cedric said, he has books available to sell. It's a very moving story. I keep buying them, and people borrow them, and somehow they forget to return them, so I buy some more. And I always enjoy reading it and find it new things. And one of the things I've learned, I'm not the best speller in the world, but why I have trouble spelling Mackenzie. Today I learned that. 